Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. So I'm Ted Dintersmith. Um, I got here with an early morning flight, which is pretty much the story of my life for the last 10 months. Um, uh, anyway, I was the, the organizer of the film Most Likely to Succeed, uh, wrote a book with the same title with Tony Wagner, and then left home uh, early September and have been to now every state in the country, um, several two and three times. And, um, you know, not, you know, part to, to be with and, and around the film, but also trying to meet with people who make the decisions on behalf of the future of kids and the future of teachers and to deliver a message that's pretty simple, which is we've had policies that have put all the priority on testing and measuring our students and teachers. We need to put our priority on engaging and inspiring them. And so uh, this whole trip has been unbelievably you know, put together by Josh. Uh, and as you guys are introducing yourself, I say, there's no table I'd rather be at than this table. It sounds like a great group. Hey, I'm Josh. And I'm Sophie. And I'm Melissa. And this is Grow the Collective Brain, which you can follow on Twitter at GTC Brain, hashtag be yourself. Check us out. What's Grow the Collective Brain about, Josh? Well, we think that wherever and whenever thoughtful people gather together and talk, the collective brain grows. As it turns out, Josh, back on May 12th, we gathered a really cool group of people together for a great conversation. Yes, we did, Sophie. Recently, the executive producer and funder behind the documentary film Most Likely to Succeed, Ted Dintersmith, stopped in Hawaii as part of his 50-state tour. And we took the opportunity to gather nine people around a table to have a conversation with Ted. How did that conversation begin, Josh? Well, this amazing group of educators, design thinkers, nonprofit, and business people were given just two prompts. The first prompt was simply this design a great conversation. Wow. The second prompt comes from permaculture theory, which argues that the problem is often the solution. That's it? Those were the only two prompts? Yep. Let's listen to the conversation and see where this group took these two prompts. Hey, I was part of the discussion, and I can tell you it went in some crazy directions. Cool. Let's roll the tape and see what happens. Awesome. Cool beans. What are the questions that people have? What are, what are you asking yourselves these days? That's always of interest to me. <laughs> One question I've been asking uh, is, uh, what is education in Hawaii look like? Mm -hmm. What's the purpose of education in Hawaii, in these islands? Maybe another question is, how is all the workforce development activities in Hawaii connected to you know, elementary school and, and all the way down to the elementary schools? How are we preparing ourselves for future events? It's very hard to predict. Mm -hmm. Two things that we've been asking heavily in our school, um, the foundational question is how do people learn or how do kids learn? Um, and I think that for us, um, Many times our teachers, our educators come out of teacher college knowing the logistics of education, uh, but not necessarily getting a really deep grounding through their studies in how understanding is acquired. Um, and then from that grounding, the other question we've been asking is, what is important to learn and understand and, and really trying to look at those priorities? I think at base what I'm really concerned about and thinking a lot about is um, how do we create structures so that kids are intrinsically motivated? Um, so how do we, um, what do we need to do as teachers and educators and, and community leaders to make sure that we're engaging our kids um, so that um, they have this fire to learn, this fire to um, really engage with not only their books and things like that, but with the world at large. So, I kind of thought everybody, every kid, had that fire. <laughs> do we quash it? I mean, oh, yeah. it's our fault. No. I mean, they do when they're five. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't when they're 18. I, I, I mean, that's an interesting point to kind of linger on for a second, because it's something we've talked about in a whole bunch of different conversations. Um, that kids really do come in with wonder and curiosity and 
how the school system really does do a great job of squashing that, not on purpose, but right, but through uh, the systems that are in place. And you know, Sophie, the question you asked was how do we create structures so that kids are intrinsically motivated, uh, and that. That interests me a lot with this idea of intrinsic motivation is something that I've been lingering on recently because the, the catch word that's always out there is engagement. And I'm wondering what people's feelings are around the difference, potential difference between intrinsic motivation and engagement. If, if one is a more appropriate lens or another, I don't have an answer to that, but it's something that we've been thinking about because so much of the education conversation is about engagement. Um, and to a certain extent, that seems external to the learner still. Um, and your your thought about intrinsic motivations is very much internal to the learner. To yeah, I mean, I um, thanks, Capono. That was really deep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> everything you say is really deep. Um, I guess what I was um, to me, I guess you know, intrinsic motivation and engagement are sort of they they sort of meet in the middle, um, uh, or maybe. They sort of are. Um, they sort of feed upon each other. Um, so, I'm sorry, my thoughts aren't really clear on that. You know, um, and I'm hoping that others can help to sort of flesh that out mm -hmm. for me. I guess when I was hearing you speak, <clears throat> what I was hearing was like, how do you kind of pull back? Like, how do you reveal? Like, how do you allow? How do you create kind of this an environment where? young people can discover and reveal to themselves and learn about and as they connect to something that inspires them that kind of pushes them pull, pulls them in a certain direction and then there's there's support to help them connect to that gift or talent that they have and so every time we talk to kids that come to our company well, I always show that thing of um, I think Einstein had this quote around if if you if you judge a frog by its ability to climb a tree, it will always think it's it's kind of like a failure. Mm -hmm. So I tell the kids, your mm -hmm. job when you go through education is to uh, to find out what is your great talent because we all have a great talent, a great skill, and a great passion. So it's like, how do you find that, and then find that place in, in the world or in school or whatever or the people to support you in doing that. And I think this is the part where education gets kind of mixed up is we flip it around, and it's like we're trying to shove kids into certain boxes, like you're you're really good at this, so you be the mathematician, right? or you be this thing. But that may not be their passion, they may be good at it, but it's not what they really care about. Yeah, if the, the center of the education universe has been and continues to be the numbers on standardized tests, which we use to answer the question, how gifted are you? And what you're saying is exactly right. We need to be asking the question, how are you gifted? And opening up a broad array of ways for kids to display their own passions, excellence, and ability to make their world better. I think we have a challenge, though, because schools traditionally are charged with imparting the wisdom and the knowledge of the past, right? So that it it's, can sort of can continue. So we want students. We want to be clear about what we want students to know and understand and be able to do. On the other hand, we want to set them up so they can follow those passions and. and kind of chart off into the unknown and I think as an educational administrator it's really hard to get that right balance I'd like to go back to the um, topic of wondering and wonderment because um, all kids have that sense of wonder somehow when they get to school they're put into structures where they don't get to explore that sense of wonder um, but I've been exposed to a program called Philosophy for Children, B for C, where they, they practice or they uh, allow kids to formulate their own questions and talk about wonder. And the way it's been set up, and actually there's a professor here at the University of Hawaii, Dr. Thomas Jackson, who's created his own sort of Hawaiian P for C using Aloha with this inquiry based. and. It's incredible, um, not only to see this in elementary school students who are genuinely, I think, more open to it, but even when you go to um, higher levels, middle school and high school, where already there are barriers, but if you can get deeper into uh, the sense of wonder for kids, so many possibilities can happen. And they're actually, I've been involved in a project where 
they're taking this E for C Hawaii to Japan because mm -hmm. Japanese education is also very structured mm -hmm. and the, Jap uh, the, the area is Sendai where the tsunami hit and a lot of these children were traumatized and didn't want to learn. So the educators and administrators there were very desperate to find something that would get the kids to be motivated again and they're utilizing this tool to, to help them really find their sense of wonder again. So it seems like there are these programs or initiatives out there, but how do we all um, understand what they are and how can we decide which ones are appropriate for our schools? If I can follow up on that, because I just moved here from Japan, oh. and my previous school worked with a, um, a school in Sendai, and um, encountered the same thing. The kids were really depressed after in, after the tsunami, and we decided that we wanted to help them out, but we let the students just communicate with the other students. What do they want? And what the Sendai kids told our kids in Kobe was they wanted to go to Universal Studios, <laughs> right? And that's what we did. And that was what really lifted their spirits. And the reason I think of it now is, is because I, I think part of this, um, you know, fostering the student passion is we have to listen to the kids. What are they interested in? What are their questions? Going back to the past, we sometimes get too wound up, I think, with imparting the wisdom of the past, which is our wisdom of the past, and not spending enough time listening to students. What, what do they want to know about? What are their questions? So right near your school is a school that's been doing philosophy for children for over a decade. It's a public school, a high school. Yeah. And I was privileged to meet with five amazing human beings there about a week ago. Um, and these five individuals are now spending um, part of every week at five other schools. And they are coach. These are high school students, and they are coaching teachers at these elementary schools on how to create classrooms built on wonder and environment. Mm -hmm. And it is so empowering to watch um, and to see. And um, so I think I challenge that. I mean, this is an example. Of, we've got this blinkered, centralized monolithic, bureaucratized, top-down school system here as everywhere else. Yeah, but I would challenge your notion that it's all driven on test scores because you've got incredibly dedicated, creative teachers everywhere. What if we say the emperor has no clothes? As is it Wiley School does, which basically says, don't pay any attention to these scores. They'll take care of themselves. What can we do to increase the wonderment of teachers? by just saying, you know what, nobody's going to fire us. We, we can't replace our own teachers in Hawaii anyway, so why don't we just do that interest us? We, we can't because we are we are almost a closed labor pool. So, you know, Ted, are there places that have just said, you know what, we do have the power. Well, it's we're a, just going to go yeah. teach differently and, and the scores will take care of themselves? It's a phenomenon that's both everywhere and nowhere. And so, um, you know, I did a screening. It was one of my favorite lines um, from an audience after my film. But I did a screening in Salt Lake City. And one of the people stood up and said, you know, there are sparks and embers of great learning going on all across our state in all of our schools. How can we turn that into a bonfire? And and what I say, your point's a great one, which is I find when teachers take a leap of faith, when they start doing things that make kids race to get to school in the morning instead of dreading it, the test scores end up taking care of themselves. Um, that's just a very hard leap for many teachers to take, particularly when the, the scores are published or you know that's part of their performance review and things. And so we make it harder than it ever should be for teachers to be the bold, courageous inspirers of kids instead of the, the measurers. But um, but I feel like that's that's the power that we could unleash, right? If we, if we trust our teachers, if we understand how innovative so many of them are, and just give them permission to try things that are bold, that dramatically improve student engagement, that help kids develop important skills and character traits, we could fix a lot of problems in education quite quickly. Who gets to give that permission to teachers? Well, you know, but some, a principal can, yeah. if they're courageous, a superintendent can, if they're willing to say that. You know, it's like everywhere in the chain, 
parents could, right? Parents could rally around a school and say, this is what we want. Um, you know, and it's really just a, a matter of having somebody step forward and saying, because I think, I love the phrase, the emperor has no clothes. You know, we have kids going through the motions on things they don't care about, memorizing things they don't retain, and in the process, leaving schools not well prepared at all for anything important in life. And, you know, but I think there are a lot of people that had that opportunity. They just, just need to have people who jump on that. I, I was surprised coming into to YLI, a school that's founded on progressive education, social constructivist principles. I, I, um, I thought that my, the, you know, uh, the school leader's permission with the backing of the board would be enough, plus 25 years of history. Um, but it's a little bit of a complex system around permissions because there's parent expectations, right? So I think we took care of the ad administration and, and board level permissions to a really high degree, and then you're working with parent expectations, right? And then you're working with the larger system where teachers are coming in with no child left behind post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, via, I don't really believe you, Capono. Like, yes, that's a great statement, but not really, because somebody's gonna swoop in and, and threaten to close us down later on based on these scores. So then there's this little bit of a self-permission that you have to give yourself permission to see, like, is it okay if your test scores drop five or 10%? Do I feel okay as a teacher about that? Um, so there's this like little bit of self-permission. One of the things that I haven't experienced at YLI, maybe because we're at elementary school, but struck me from your film, Ted, was um, the, the kids giving themselves permission, right? And so there's that one scene where the kids are like, but no, just teach me how to do the test. Right. So I, I think it's a little bit of a complicated question, but it's definitely happening. But it's complex. I often wonder about, for example, my mother's generation. My mother was an elementary school teacher here in Hawaii. And when I talk to her about education today, she doesn't understand it. It seems like she had tremendous permission to implement whatever she felt was appropriate for her children. And it sounded like she never had any trouble with her kids um, in terms of, or, or parents for that matter. It, it, it seemed like it was a very free, open, she could do what she wanted, she had a lot of permission from principals. So I often wonder, why, why was there that change? Is it that it, our system wasn't good enough? Do we want to go back to that? Can we not go back to that because it was a generation ago? Um, I, I, but did you see in that generation them taking advantage of that? I didn't. Because I'm mean, wondering if it's I, a cultural... Well, I asked my mother that, like, did you know, did you have teachers who really didn't care or you know, was clock in, clock out? And she didn't seem to think so, but maybe she wasn't thinking of the others and she was only thinking of herself. Um, I, I just, it just, every time I have that conversation with her, I, I often, I, I just can't see how it was then and how it is now and how, how different it is. It makes me wonder. It makes me wonder. You know, I'm, a, I'm in an international baccalaureate school, and in IB schools, we, we unabashedly teach to the test because it's a really good test. And I think this is part of our, our problem is we don't like our tests that, w that we're giving. We don't like that whole machinery that goes, goes with it. But that doesn't mean that we don't want to know what our impact is on, on the student learning. Um, there is, a, uh, I think, for a long time, I think teaching was more of an art than a science. But there's a strong empirical basis now for what constitutes effective teaching. Um, and we should know what our impact is without getting you know without getting too focused on those on those numbers and those results i was just interested when you talk about that here you know in business you talk about kpis key performance indicator yeah. and score, metrics and we have metrics for schools and tests but you know those metrics cause us to go in a certain direction right mm -hmm. it'd be interesting if if we actually came up with, with new metrics mm -hmm. around our mm -hmm. that Took into account something, maybe, you know, again, about it's, it's a like the metrics that are around about, about a person, about a student at the individual level versus okay, you got you know a 97 on your math test. You know, what is the what is the metric for a person, you know, for a student in terms of their motivation, their engagement? I don't know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? We have these 
I think we have like these metrics, but they're they're, they're creating a certain kind of result. Mm-hmm. Like, what are the new metrics that we could invent and mm-hmm. create that? And how can we involve students in in formulating yeah. their own metrics, metrics yeah. right? Yeah. And I think it comes down to, I mean, sort of defining what success is, like redefining it, or maybe success is different for everyone, you know? And that's the question we're actually literally grappling with as we do focus groups across the state. And the big question for the strategic plan is what, how, do, how do you define student success? And there is no right now state definition of what student success is. Um, and it feels like it's such an individualized thing, but then how do you then design a system um, that has to reach every child? So it's a big, I don't, yeah. No, you know, yeah. I, mean, I was just thinking about a, a, a teacher I had, he was really a professor, and he was, at the time, everyone thought he was crazy, because he would, he would, he, he at some level, he, he knew that everyone was different, mm-hmm. but he kind of, but he's kind of said, you know, there's individual, you can, you can wait, you're actually creating your own way of being graded, mm-hmm. and he kind of said, there's a team score, and there's an individual score, mm-hmm. and you wait, how much you want it is because some people are very good team players and some people are just really good individual players and you he and, Reem, and he really like let you kind of design how you were going to get graded and then he always been giving you constant coaching and feedback mm-hmm. so like you're always and he would even forecast how how you're doing like if you keep doing what you're doing you're going to ex- do extremely well right or whatever it is but i mean there was the traditional metrics but he was allowing us to mm-hmm. design it mm-hmm. Around you know the way he had to score it at some level to to the fact to the so their sense of something fixed and then something yeah. flexible. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I thought that was brilliant. And, and there's some good news in Hawaii. I think this um, we all have until the end of May to uh, send up answer the questions on a survey of what we think student success uh, is and what, where we think our school system should head. So I forget what the website is, but. Go to Hawaii State Teacher. I'll get postcards out <laughs> um, Also, you know, when, when Hawaii won a Race to the Top grant and the teachers union agreed to tie teacher evaluations to test scores, what they found out was that not very many teachers were just math teachers or English language teachers, but it wasn't fair if they were the only ones who had teacher is student learning tied to their evaluation as a teacher so they started looking at other measures of success called student learning objectives so if i'm an art teacher or music teacher what success look like so there's been a huge amount of uh, work on defining uh, student success in different ways Mm -hmm. and then more recently i just learned that um, several uh, school districts in California have been banding together and using the new um, successor law to the No Child Left Behind uh, to build social emotional learning measures into their own ways in which they define school and student success and teacher success for that matter. So I think there's going to be some innovation coming on. I hope so. I think this ties back to sort of what I was trying to articulate um, in the very beginning about like intrinsic motivation and, and engagement and on the sort of other side, extrinsic motivation. What I notice a lot about, you know, some of our kids is, you know, they're, they're doing something for the grade. They're mm-hmm. doing something because their teachers approve or, the, you know, um, rather than saying doing something or learning something because they, they truly are interested in it or they find something fascinating or they're wondering about something. And um, I think part of it is because for so long we had been defining su- success as this bar that everyone needs to meet. And if you don't meet that bar, then you're not successful. And so the more we can sort of redefine success to be uh, more about individuals creating their own path and individuals um, setting their own pace, um, individuals um, defining what success is for them and um, breaking them away from time. You know, I mean, why do you have to be su- successful within a quarter or a semester? You know, I mean, speaking to your film, that boy who kept at right. it until, yeah. <laughs> until yeah, yeah. he got it. And then it's like the elation that he felt, you know, um, uh, you know, 
he learned more from failing within a certain period of time than succeeding, you know, within that time. So how do we make that, how do we scale that? You know, how do we scale that? Because that's, yeah. I think you've got us on a great theme of the intrinsic motivation because we, we have, largely taken that out of the equation for not just students but also teachers mm-hmm. right and and you look oh, one of the questions I get asked a lot is um, the achievement gap right mm-hmm. and I think a big contributor there right is that when kids find the work they're doing in school boring which many many do the kid that has the two tiger parents that are on them like a dog on a pork chop telling them you've got to do it you know tutoring them hiring tutors push 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 that kid will on paper look like they're doing quite well and they will score better on certain things they're, they're not interested in it they're just pushed to do it and then the kid that's in a tougher home situation that's not they don't get that same sort of pressure but what I find, and it's really, I think, an inspiring possibility here, is where kids are working on things they care about, suddenly the kids that are in tougher circumstances have a lot of those characteristics that match well to that. You know, they, they're they resourceful. They think outside the box. They're not worried about failure because they see so much of it around them, and they will never give up. And if we can start to do that and just sort of respect what is just so fundamental to the way people are, which is they want to work on things they have a say in that they believe are important. And by and large, U.S. education policy has people working on things they don't have any say in and they don't believe are important, largely because they are. I, I wonder about um, how do we acknowledge growth? Mm-hmm. I mean, so much of our emphasis is on, on these sort of static conditions. You know, your success if you do this and then you've reached a successful state. Um, but how do we how do we acknowledge learning is about growth, right? It's about transformation. How do we value that in our metrics or in our process? Sometimes I feel like it's the words we use that block us. So, you know, we talk about success and failure, mm-hmm. and can we ban the F word? <laughs> you know? Um, uh, and even the S word. Yeah, yeah. You know, can we, I mean, there's so many things that we, we talk about where we've like sort of unintentionally created dichotomies when maybe it should just be a continuum. Um, it, it makes me think about that a lot. Um, and again, um, Michael Michael Thompson, whom I'm sure many of you, you know, um, he gave a talk at our school one day um, and he said... Um, just talking about sort of student you know, student learning and motivation and you know and even even us as, as adults he said um, um, are you um, successful 100% of the time and of course we say no you know and he's like but are you doing your best right now with what you have and we're like yeah we're, we're doing our best all the time but we may not be 100% successful all the time mm-hmm. you know so <laughs> I um, it, it makes me think about um, honoring and celebrating where we're at at the moment um, and not, um, you know, not having that, um, that marker at the end that's like the finish line that everyone must cross because it's really about the journey. Mm. Um, and, and again, the systems that we have set in place in terms of like grades and um, you know, quarters and semesters and years and great, you know, um, progressing through the grades, that blo- that blocks a lot of that um, journey is so important for kids mm-hmm. and for, I think, adults, just human beings. Mm-hmm. So. so culturally, supposedly, we are a place that uh, is a little bit risk averse because we don't want to bring shame on our mm-hmm. families. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, at Ocean and Box Jelly, you're surrounded with people who just don't think that way at all and screw up all the time and fail <laughs> over and over and over again. So how did they get how did you guys get how did you get through Castle High School <laughs> and sort of have this exuberance for trying stuff out, not really caring whether it worked or not? How do your peers think? That's a tough question. Yeah. But I was I was related to this. Is how, how do you how do you 
KPI or, or teach as well this the idea of this mindset of that failure is not failing, but failing is learning. Mm-hmm. Right? But we don't learn that. I mean, it is bad. I mean, you, you know, it, it, I think only, I, I, Terry, honestly, I think only in the last five years as we were learning this process of design thinking that I really felt like that learning, a failing was learning. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's, it is painful. Failing is not something that anybody teaches you, even from a young age, to embrace. We're, we're, we're kind of trained and everything, even uns- the, probably the most hardest thing is the unspoken thing that is, you know, when you fail, everybody, they don't say it, but everyone is disappointed versus saying, you know what, what did we learn? Mm-hmm. And being excited about it. Not like, oh my God, you know, this is so bad. And so teaching the mindset of, is actually one of the things we don't get in school, I feel like. It's, God, if I actually had learned this, somebody had encourage me like it's not bad it's what did you learn and, and that really got drilled into me it's, it's you could imagine what we would do or what kids would do and what we would be doing today if, if we had that as part of us that the failing is not a bad thing but that is so like ingrained in us as a society and that's what makes it hard i think there's a big part of it it makes me want to connect this back to including our students in this discussion Um, We do student-led conferences at our school where we actually sit down at the end of the semester and we talk with our students and look at their work with the parent. Um, And they are completely in charge of discussing where they made a mistake, what they could have done better. And you see which kids are learning to persevere. And they're like a dog with a pork chop, I think. That's going to stick in my head all okay. um, And so, that if that's the mindset, then how can we use tools like having those authentic conversations with students, not with a rubric in front of us, um, not necessarily with a metric that we're going to say, mm, you know, you're, where do you think you are on the scale of one to ten? Um, I'm not sure if we. and this is an honest question, can we have an authentic conversation with a family and a student with that rubric sitting in front of us um, as the thing that we're using to measure? Mm -hmm. We're gonna turn that into someone and that's the accountability um, piece. Um, Does that take away that intrinsic motivation that we're trying to build through that conversation? I actually feel like one, one of the things we have going for us as a society is we are bold, we are inventive, we are creative and and when I visit schools and meet with people in Asian society they'll say you know how do we get more creative people out of our schools what's your secret and then when they hear what we're doing where we're trying to catch them on standardized tests they say you've got to be kidding why would you ever do that but you know back to the point because it's such an important one is over and over when you look at schools and the assessment mechanics Kids are not told to take chances. Kids are not told to risk a mistake. I mean, if you have a, a test or an essay you've got to hand in, for most kids in America, they are given every signal. Do the safe, simple, non-controversial essay that your teacher will like because you will not get a chance to get feedback. Redo it, redo it, redo it. And if we just had, you know, design thinking, you know, I love that. I love what you said about that. But, but it goes beyond you know, software or building bridges. You know, you can have design thinking in a history class it can be really powerful where you say, try some bold ideas, try them out in your classmates and your teacher and see what they think. And if it falls flat, try another bold idea. Just keep trying them until something starts to get traction and makes sense to you. And and then you start to, you know, because it's like I have yet to visit a school these days, particularly that doesn't have on its website the importance of grit. It's like the trend <laughs> word of the 21st century. And and yet their idea of grit in many cases is we're going to give kids incredibly boring things they don't care yeah. about and just say, keep, <laughs> keep, keep drilling and this will teach you grit. Right? But then you look at how they're graded. And the, the grading, me- you know, grading mechanisms have nothing to do with supporting perseverance, determination, innovation, and creativity. And, so, and they're not huge changes to make. I mean, almost any school could start to just say, okay, you get multiple drafts on the things you're doing. We are giving you comments for a reason, so you can actually make it better. And I want to go back really quick to um, the systems versus culture thing, because I think you, you really pushed us, but I want to make it explicit for a second around um, 
culture and cultural traits that may or may not play into risk or or are not risk, right? And I would I would uh, I, I would assert that it's more of a systems thing than a cultural thing, right? So usually in cultural communication, there's there's uh, it, it's been captured uh, in uh, direct and indirect communication on one axis and um, emotionally expressive, emotionally reserved on another axis. And I actually don't think either of those axes of cultural traits have very much to do with risk aversion, risk tolerance, ambiguity, or innovation. I mean, if you look at some of the greatest societies in the world that were uh, indirect and emotional uh, and uh, emotionally uh, reserved versus emotionally expressive. Um, there has been just as many amazing innovations that have come out of those cultures. Um, I would say that you know what you said just a second ago, Ted, around um, about the systems, right? So you look at, at an American culture that is very expressive, uh, maybe uh, emotionally reserved, but very direct in communication. And really, what's holding us back is is a system. And I think it's same that's that same system in other places because and if you look at like. Japan, like tea ceremony, you look at Hawaii, like hula uniki, right? You're looking at systems that um, prioritize excellence and leave huge room for failure until you get to that excellent point, right? You uniki and hula when you're ready to uniki and hula. Mm -hmm. You're not tested at a certain time. When when you're ready, you get there and you reach that area of excellence. And I think it, it kind of comes down to systems that, for me, a couple of things, systems that um, prioritize authentic and real things, uh, prioritize something that is uh, intrinsically uh, part of uh, what somebody wants. And then also something I've been thinking a lot about, this idea of like, excellence versus rigor. Like rigor is very <laughs> externally Im imposed. Like a rigorous class many kids fail from. Right? But, but what are systems that um, leverage in intrinsic motivation for students to reach excellence? So I, I just wanted to make that point before w we went down a path where we're saying that you know certain cultures inspire more innovation or not. I really think it's a systems thing and not a cultural trait thing. I'm really curious about your about that topic of rigor too. Mm -hmm. Can you t tell me more about you? what are your thoughts about what? Yeah, it's what one of my least favorite rigors? words. Oh. Um, not because the word itself is bad, right? It's because right. of our educational systems interpretation of the word, right? If something's rigorous, we use that a lot, right? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the stem word of like rigor mortis and things like that, right? Um, it, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's what, what does that describe? It describes a difficult, challenging situation, right. and there's many things in there that are good. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you if you just ask for the definition of that word on face value, it's so easy to define that as a situation where um, the bar is so high, kids can't get over it, and therefore I'm this great teacher because 50% of my kids fail. Look how rigorous my mm -hmm. course is, right? And it is about the bar being high, but is it about the bar being so high that none of your kids can pass? Or is it about the bar being very high and us inspiring excellence? And then what's your bar about? Does your bar make any sense? Mm. And I think a lot of times with rigor, it oftentimes points to bars that make no sense. Mm. I don't even want to go over that bar. And the bar, I mean, so th th can, I, can we throw it back to our, our um, industry people for a second? Because we haven't heard too much from them. I'm wondering, Ian, you talked about human metrics. So when I talk to, to my um, incoming parents at YLI, we talk about... Um, less credence on these test scores, right? So when I write a holiday card back to my families, I'm not writing the, like my kid's English score. Like, hey, happy holidays. Your grandson got a 72 in English, right? Like there's other things you're writing home, things that are more important. My kid did X. My kid is a good this. My kid is developing in this. I'm wondering what are those human metrics from workforce because we have this, I mean, as you can see, like our educators, we have no problem talking here, right? We could take over this entire thing and we tend to talk to each <laughs> ourselves. And because you guys live in it, so we, we guys, live in it, live but, so in it. But so much of what I mean, we, we have these metrics that are there for us, and they're things that are, are, are given to us because we can measure them, right? Reading, writing, math, and now maybe tech. And those are skills that our kids need now in today's world. Maybe not 75 years from now. Might we be downloading these things into our brain? And might you have a really successful kid who's not a great writer, who's not a great reader? And could you be running the world and not have amazing reading and writing skills 50 years from now? Maybe. Well, what are those? What are those human-centered metrics that you guys are seeing now that might inform us so we? I can shut up for a second. No, no. Sorry. <laughs> You're asking, I think, a really important question. And when we actually have students come over, I. I actually try to make a really strong point about it's really important for you to have an education of whatever sort it is, but that's not enough. That when we look for people 
We're not looking for people, we're not looking for the Einstein that can't work with anyone. But we need people who are who are people, who are humans. And and, and so I, I show them this graph of like when we look for people, we're looking for skills and experiences, but that's only half. Mm -hmm. The other half is the character. Yeah. It's you as a person. And where do you learn this, right? I said, so so you can be the smartest kid in the school, but you may not get a you may not want you because nobody wants to work with you, play with you. <laughs> like like learning social skills and how to you know, be with people and communicate and work as a team and manage your ego. Like these soft skills are like I think it's as important as, as the calculus one, two, and three you're going to do in engineering school and the physics class or whatever it is. And never use. That they never use, yeah. But I said, but that's like, don't think that just because you're the smartest kid intellectually that you're going to make it in the world. So part of it is there's these all of these soft social skills, the emotional IQ stuff that I think, how do we, how do we teach that? Because I didn't learn that in business school. I learned it from my parents. I learned it from interacting with other students, with my teachers. Actually, my teachers. I, I remember one teacher, I was I fell asleep in her class in high school. And because I was working a part-time job, and I would finish work really late. And I remember being her math at class, and I fell asleep. And she got so mad, and she just was, in front of the whole class, just pointing me out. But later on, somebody went to her and said, you know, he's actually, I don't think he did it on purpose. It's not because he's bored, it's because I was working this part-time job. Right? And so she came up after to me and apologized. And that like totally blew my mind because she was one of these really strict, tough teachers that I would say is pretty righteous and would never say she's wrong. I, that's what would have been my impression. But she did that and I went, wow. That's, that, you know, that was like a big thing. I was like, well, you, can, you can be wrong and you can say I'm wrong and not hide behind, well, I'm the teacher, you're the student, so it doesn't matter. So it's modeled to you. Yeah, it was modeled. Yeah. So that, how do we do that piece? Because that's the piece that I feel like, and, and that's the part that's really important for us as a company that, you know, everyone's asking, are you guys in the educational business? You guys spend so much time with these kids. But I tell them, it's because I'm going to inherit whatever you don't do. So in 10 years, these kids are going to come to me. In 10 years, I'm really like, okay, they're brilliant, but nobody can work together. Yeah. Or they're they're making each other crazy and they're they're you know not, but what's unique is about it, but I think what actually somebody should talk about this is is our culture here in Hawaii because we I think grow good people I mean there's there's a thing here that happens in Hawaii that I maybe I mean it happens in other parts of that I'm sure it happens all over the world but I feel like being from Hawaii there's a special thing that happens for our young people and how do we keep in terms of their emotional, that they're good people. Not to say there's good people all over, but I've been all over the world. I've worked with really great people, and I can tell you that that we have here in Hawaii people that are world class. Absolutely. I totally agree, which is why I start with my own question what's the purpose of education in Hawaii? We're not in Kansas. Kansas is a good place, but they should have their own conception of the purpose of education, but we. Um, are in the middle of the Pacific. We are a place of amazing courage and ingenuity. I mean, we have had the finest navigators in the world who uh, you know, could sail for thousands of miles without any instruments at all. At the time when the Europeans were afraid of going beyond sight of shore, we're amazing agronomists. We had the most advanced agriculture there was in the 14th and 15th century. And just today, um, we now have a new Congressional Gold Medal of Honor for another amazing set of Hawaii citizens who actually said, you know how we're going to fight all this discrimination against Nisei Japanese? We're going to go fight for the country that's discriminating against us and is putting our families in prison. So we've got all the DNA we need. But we also have unique, um, I think, uh, challenges that other states maybe don't face. Uh, we don't have an inter island electricity grid. We import about 90% of our food. We produce about 90% of our fuel from um, from oil. Um, we have 4,000 homeless children right now, right today. In fact, we can probably see some of them. We have some binoculars. So maybe what we should do with our education is own who we are and that strong part of our DNA that we all have 
and uh, own the Aloha spirit that we do have. Um, and maybe as adults present as opportunities for learning, all our failures as adults, all the stuff we've screwed up on so that kids can work on authentic problems. And actually, we need the solutions to employ. And as a result, I think we'll get the citizens that we need too. And I love that because um, you know, you're engaging with local issues that are completely relevant and real um, that our kids can um, help to solve. But um, those um, issues that they're working on, they can go anywhere in the world and transfer those skills that they would learn here locally you know, to help um, solve electricity grid problems somewhere in Asia or, or in Africa, you know? And so I love looking at um, our locality, like looking at that through a global lens, actually, and um, talking to our kids about local issues is not only, oh, it's just a, a thing that's just Hawaii, but it's actually sort of, mm -hmm. it would contribute actually to solving problems in the world. Yeah. Go back to what Ian said about what he looks for when he talks to kids or potential employers, because it sounds like it's relationships. So kids who have know how to build relationships, and maybe in our education system we don't we take it for granted, perhaps, because a lot of emphasis is on trying to um, capture knowledge. But the relationship part, right? I mean, you have to learn to get along with people to do teamwork to. And maybe it's not taught, and maybe some people just have it easier than others. But maybe that's something that we're not, like I said, I think we need to be taken for granted. But I think that also goes back to what Terry was saying in this cultural context, because when you look at Native Hawaiian culture, education didn't take place siloed, like in a, in a classroom. It was very much integrated with with their trade, with their family. And I think one of the best definitions of ohana I've ever heard, I think it was from Kamala Inos, who is kind of unpacking the word. And at the root of ohana, which is family, the word means family, is hana, which is work. And that was because so much of the family was tied with the work, which was tied with the education. And all of those things intrinsically were so much a part and done in relationship. Um, and I think of a lot of these anime-based programs and, and which is very much applied for project-based learning and getting back in the land and hands-on type projects, um, is been so successful because it kind of brings that cultural piece back together and all of these different things that have been siloed and work, mm -hmm. family, and education together and it's such a beautiful narrative. But it also has such powerful 21st century implications as we think about food security, as we think about water and all of these things that we grapple with as an island that we need to problem solve. A lot of those things that happened in farming and, and, and um, I know work were so much about very technical things in science that that people were learning that apply very much to today and solving a lot of the problems um, or a lot of the challenges that we face. Uh, I'd like to add um, like a common sense and like an ability to be proactive to, to solve things because for us, a lot of times when I hire someone, things are changing so fast, like I can't answer your question. It's like, how did this, I don't know. It's different than it was last year. And it would be interesting to have educators kind of, like how do you solve that? How do you get kids to really figure things out on their own and be smarter than the boss, the teacher? Yeah, yeah just your comments make me think about um, what it is we want to teach kids what, what do we think is valid subject matter and it strikes me that we do a huge disservice to kids when we talk about education as preparation for the real world you know like um, one it, it sends them a signal that their experience now is somehow not real that they're living these inferior lives and, and plus I think it also vastly overrates the adult life well the idea that as you as you get to an adult okay now you're successful now you've got all these things worked out and you know you don't need to learn anymore which I think you, you know there's nobody in here probably says I'm done learning 
and it is how do we present them with um, subjects to study that they're intrinsically motivated to learn, that they're interested in, they're passionate about, that matters. Whereas a lot of the stuff we, we give them doesn't seem to matter to them. Right? It doesn't seem to matter. Or how do you teach, or how do you inspire? I don't know what it is that makes them love learning. I mean, that's the thing, actually, the one thing I definitely... One of the major things I felt I felt like I got from going to university or going to college was how to learn. I had to teach myself how to learn. I went to Castle. I, I spent a little bit too much time surfing and playing around. So not the only one. So, so you know, I had to really like go, wow, how do I learn? I had to teach myself how to learn. But then but then having a love of learning. You know, that's like that's a great mindset right? to love learning. Like always, and being curious, and never stopping, and always, you know, like that's like what what kids have to be. Because like Rachel said, you don't know. So you learn this skill, how to do a thing. But guess what? That job you're doing may not be around in two or three years. In, in seventy-five years, guaranteed, that job is not going to be there. It's going to be totally different. A robot's going to maybe be doing it, but maybe you're the robot supervisor, or you're the robot mechanic. I don't know what it is, but it's going to change. So the how things or the technical things are learning today, they're going to be irrelevant very quickly. So how do we teach a mindset where learning and adapting um, and being open and being coachable and being okay with failing is like a core thing, just as, as much as we're teaching some other subjects like math or English. Yeah. Yeah. And Oregon High School around a completely different world, right? I'm, I'm probably the oldest person here, but you know, when I was in school, the places you could get information the teacher, the library, or the World Book Encyclopedia. And, and that was it, right? And and by the way, the World Book and the library were very inefficient. You know, and today, if you're curious and interested, you, you can learn at a million miles an hour, right? But but we don't really teach and encourage kids to learn in an entirely new environment. We you know a couple of points I want to make is that that the school system today, it, it isn't all bollocks up by accident, right? It, it was thoughtfully designed 125 years ago. And, and people then had courage and vision that we lack today. They said, we're going from agriculture to manufacturing. We want kids to be able to do routine tasks, never get bored, be time efficient, make no mistakes, and for heaven's sakes, never be creative. I mean, Henry Ford doesn't want a creative assembly line worker. And and so they did that, right? They did that. And then I think the error we made as a you know, nation in terms of education policy is to say, let's take that obsolete model and try to make it better by testing more. And then that didn't work. So now let's hold teachers accountable to those tests. That might work. And and it's failed. And it's failed colossally. And, and as you say, in, in the process, the collateral damage is so widespread. You know, we've demoralized so many teachers. We've made it not as attractive a profession as it needs to be. And kids are not, honestly, you know, they're not coming out. I mean, you see the same thing from business I saw. I mean, the, the kids that were coming out of, even the winners, even the ones that looked great on paper academically, were not the kids that could figure out complicated things. They were not the kids that would be proactively finding problems in your organization and solving them. And, you know, following up on your point, um, the senior person at Apple recently said, we have decided any employee that needs a manager is no longer employable. And, and But we have a school system that says keep having your manager, you know, and, and keep kicking it down the road. You know, you go to high school to then go to college to then go to graduate school. Instead of saying we want kids, you know, at some point schools should be saying we want you, our goal is to make ourselves irrelevant, right? We want kids that are so driven and so focused and so able to learn, they don't need us anymore. That's a scary thought for schools, but it's a good objective. So, I don't know if you have time, Ted, but one of my favorite schools that uh, has gone through the worst of how that well that system works and has gone back up is Palolo School. So, in 2003, I started doing after school tutoring, reading to kids at this school. And this was a school that had completely failed. It was the worst school we had in the entire state in reading. And I remember sitting at a table like this with a principal who was in tears. Um, and they had failed. And so what they did was uh, they kind of uh, just marshaled everything they could and put as much instruction around improving reading scores as 
than possibly could, and they nearly tripled their reading proficiency scores for third grade. But because they were below the cut line of No Child Left Behind, they were still a failing school. Mm. But what happened was very interesting to this principal who admitted defeat, her school was suddenly taken over by Edison. She decided to um, learn everything she could from this outside provider and go look at schools that had turned around. Um, and she completely tempered, it was like tempered steel in, in the end for her. And she, they emerged out of the worst and then she declared to the faculty and the students, we're gonna become a school solely focused on um, climate change adaptability and sustainability for Hawaii. And every grade, students are gonna come up with their essential question that they wanna deal with. So the kindergarten nurse decided they wanted to find out why rainforests were important. And then fourth graders wanted to find out, you know, what's the best energy solution for Hawaii? So. I would go to their May Day program, and in Hawaii, May Day is where the kids dance and they sing, and um, it's a great opportunity for parents to come. But many schools are beginning to transform that into a demonstration of learning. And this school was handing out GMO-free seeds from their seed bank to the Speaker of the House of our legislature who went to that school 50 years earlier. And they were doing amazing experimentation and the teachers were transformed too. It was just so much fun to see. And we can cite school after school, I'm sure yours is like that too, um, that is beginning to somehow push back on this notion that they are all, they have a lack of agency. Both they as teachers and the school and the students have a lack of agency. Lo and behold, they're finding they do have agency. So how do we actually explode the myth that we have to keep the system that we have? And then we have to have legislators change something or policies change. Why don't we just start doing it? Yeah, Kauai has lots of pockets of success. Of those embers that are burning. How do we keep that? How do you keep spreading it? Yeah. Create a, well, one of the things to extending on that, what, how do we keep that sense of play? You, you talked before about, you know, people that you, you can't work with them. You can't, you said you can't play with them. And we were talking before about, you know, taking time off to go surf. Well, nobody had to tell you, oh, Ian, time to go Practice your surfing now, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Be ready for your multiple yeah. choice surf question. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think that's the, the really young kids, they do have that sense of play and they associate it with learning. And then, you know, the old Mark Twain quote never let the, your schooling get in the way of your education, right? Um, the schooling kind of takes over. So, how do we incorporate play into the schooling? So, yeah, that they want to show up every day, they can't wait to get there. I'm, I'm wondering a little bit about um, these pockets of, uh, of excellence and taking um, good school, failing schools, we're using the F word, can we use F word <laughs> on the radio? Failing schools and um, going to good. So, you know, having done um, PD with Ruth uh, later, once they were already successful in engineering design process and seeing what those kids were doing, and I know St. Andrew's School coming over and seeing those kids, and, I, and so many teachers have said, you know, this is kindergartner using chi squared, like because he understands it. Like I don't even understand chi squared. Like what it, what is happening at this school, right? Um, that that's an amazing transformation. I'm also wondering, whole system wide, and what and what Ted is seeing going around the United States, if if that is is the is the path. Or if Ted, what you're exploring is a path where you know we have a, a, a basically a formula, you know, four walls, one teacher, 25 kids times nine months equals education, uh, with a big roadblock being childcare that we could do something different, but there's no money to provide the appropriate childcare for two working parents, and therefore we need this similar system of education. It, is it a question of reverse engineering, or is it a question of blowing up? I mean, I'm thinking about like email versus Facebook, right? So like we had paper letters 
and we took paper letters and we put it in a digital platform and we created email. And then somebody kind of like blew it up and said, let's try something totally different and let's do Facebook, let's do Twitter. Are we doing the email version of like blended learning schools and, you know, blowing up the four walls but keeping the 25 kids and the teacher or blowing up the physical school and moving it into a digital platform? Or are we like really starting from scratch? What what are what have you seen, and what is what is the path forward on this? Well, the the good news, and there's a lot of good news, is that um, it's not as though you know if you look at something like nuclear fusion, where mm-hmm. we spent decades trying to invent something and make it work, and it may never work, right? Is I've already seen a half a dozen schools here doing amazing things. I mean, it's not as though. This state needs to travel to Finland to find how to do amazing educational experiences for their kids. It's there. I mean, it's being done. The question is, how do you turn it from being something that 1% of the kids experience to something that 100%? Because you know, you know the, the thing that compels me on this is um, the urgency, you know, because you mentioned the r- robotics. Well, you know, it's it's quite literally beyond any of our imaginations in terms of how fast the progress of machine intelligence will be. I mean, some of you may have read they just they just designed software to beat the world's best Go player, you know, which is dramatically more challenging than the world's best chess player. And, uh, and you know, it's like there will be millions of jobs that are just wiped out over the next, you know, 10 years. And all the jobs that used to just absorb kids coming out of school will be gone. We need to understand that because... That means if schools are slow to change, there are going to be millions of kids just left adrift. So there's urgency. There are existence proofs. We've got it. We know what to do. And then the question, I I often joke that as I've traveled, that if I had $20 for everybody who said, I know we need to do it, but the system won't let me, I would have paid for the film. (laughs) (laughs) That would have been a nice thing. Um, But, you know, because it's like everybody's just sort of locked in. And I think the biggest thing we can do is get cover every step of the way to encourage there's you know one of the things that that we may want to talk about at some point the problem is the solution right if the problem is having kids come out of school innovative creative and bold the solution is to empower teachers and students to be innovative creative and bold right and so if we could do that and start celebrating the things that are working but not insist on cookie cutter i think too often so much of education with primarily at the federal level but often at the state is they just borrow a play out of central planning of the Soviet Union. We have decided that this is what everybody needs to do. We will give us just 10 years to put out the 600-page manifesto on this. We will then drop ship it on every teacher's desk, and that's what you got to do. And, and by the time they get it done, it's obsolete. It never made sense, and nobody wanted to do it. But if we just sort of say, this school's doing amazing things in their way, this school's doing amazing things in their way, and start encouraging... Because as I say, I'm a big believer in the innovation that's in the teaching force. But I feel like a lot of times, as somebody said, the uh, was it UPS, you know, the post-traumatic stress syndrome from and No Child Left Behind, it's very real, yeah. right? It is very, very real when you've got a whole bunch of different agents in the system discouraging something creative. We need to counterbalance that. Um, and, and the other thing, I'm just going to wind on this, is that, that the opportunity here in this state goes beyond the 200,000 kids in school here, right? Because this state, I think, could demonstrate to the world how something at scale could really make enormous progress. And there's so many other kids. I mean, we're fighting not just for 200,000 kids, we're fighting for a billion kids. And and so I feel like the the types of innovation I've seen, the, the kind of the collaborative collegial nature of the people here, you know, it's like, it's there. And it could actually change the course of not just the lives of kids here, but the lives of kids all around the globe. Let me ask the teachers here to Ted's point of what we have. We learn from each other, teacher to teacher. Where do you get ideas from that you then are able to try out in your school? Um, I absolutely love the fact that we've been talking about uh, technology to a, some extent, robots, robots taking over the world. Um, I'll admit, I love to be a geek out with other teachers also, and um, I find a lot of resources online. Um, Facebook has a tremendous amount of information that I harvest regularly, um, and there is a kind of hive mind of teacher geeks um, and, and across social media, and that's really exciting because we find each other, and we're able to have amazing conversations there's a whole movement now on Twitter, these ed chats, 
where people ask really probing questions and everybody just dives in and we tear apart these questions and it's a it's an amazing experience and if you would have asked me five years ago if I would have gotten on Twitter and had a professional discussion that would have advanced my knowledge I would have said probably not but it's, it's amazing um, so Definitely going beyond Hawaii is a big part of um, what excites me about being an educator sometimes, but also the time to talk to the teacher next door to me that has the same students that I share um, and asking them, hey, what's going well, what's not going well, just those collegial discussions that are not necessarily talking about data. You know, how's little Jimmy's test score? What do we need to do to improve his test score? I don't find that that's what inspires me, if that's what we're talking about as a teacher, as an educator. It's about, um, wow, this guy came to school today after being absent for a week, and it's because I called home and I actually got a hold of somebody, and through the coconut wireless, as we call it here in Hawaii, somebody told somebody else, hey, did you know that he's not going to school? And whoop, here he comes back to school. Um, somebody called for me. Those are the kinds of things um, that um, advance me as a teacher. The relationships are so important with my students, with the other teachers. But um, I'll definitely give a shout out to technology also because that's an amazing resource. I think so much of um, that has been ignored, um, but I think is you know has um, is coming back is um, the importance of relationships. You know, um, not only. Because um, I think for so long, you know, teaching has been seen as, you know, you sort of input into students and then there's the output, you know, like they they have learned and, okay, they have the information now, they can go on their merry way, but it's so much more complex than that. And it's almost like the kids, um, they, they need to feel that they're loved, you know, you know, by a teacher, by a counselor, um, by the principal, whatever it is. Um, and that is one of the ways that they, they keep going. Um, another thing that I think is so important is the the teacher to teacher relationships. And so being able to have time to actually sit down and have a cup of coffee and just start talking. Um, that's been really, really valuable for me as a teacher, also as an administrator. Um, and that inspires me to keep working. Um, and I imagine too that kids need that social time where they're just sort of chatting and, and, and talking about things to sort of um, spark that inspiration um, that, that they can sort of hold on to and, and explore. And I think, I mean, one of the maybe, I don't, easier things that we could do within our schools is just, can we provide some time? You know, just some time, because it's hard to wonder about things or be curious about things or think deeply about things if we don't have time to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I just feel like our, our time is so um, structured and split into these mini chunks called periods that, you know, just when you're getting to think about something, you have to move on to the next thing. And so how can we, how do we change that? You know, how can we give ourselves permission to have time? And even if you're not thinking about anything, <laughs> you know, that's okay. Even if you're daydreaming, that's okay because eventually you're gonna come to a place where you're you're ready. Um, you know, where you're ready to wonder and think deeply. And I think we need to be able to give our kids that, that time as well. You know, in business, it's very much, we're create. We're always trying to create spaces, or really opportunities for people to mm -hmm. to to intersect, mm -hmm. right, in the kitchen or wherever. Because it's those moments where people are like banging into each other, and they have the moment. They're eating lunch together or having some coffee, where all the new stuff happens. But if you, you're right, if you don't create intentionally those kinds of situations. You can never, you'll never, it's hard to change, right? Yeah, so anything. I totally agree. You give me a great idea, actually, because I, I think it's a good idea. Well, if it you can blame him. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I have this problem at my, at my current school. We have a lack of space. And th so there is no faculty lounge. And there's actually not a, like a place where faculty can go to eat together, right? So we, we're missing some of that synergy of people bumping in together. Maybe we should have a get some funding and have a, a place, you know, 
downtown here is something call it the faculty lounge where um, <laughs> it's a lounge you go get a beer a glass of wine and educators come and we all come together and we're, yeah, we're talking right and you having events like this right yeah. Yeah. yeah you get you get the broader community because <laughs> the thing I see it's the Harold Castle Ocean at Dinter Smith <laughs> yeah <laughs> center for faculty <laughs> lounge <laughs> Writing it down. Yeah, right. <laughs> I should look for the grant proposal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I should. I should just confess. I am motivated often by micro beer. <laughs> <laughs> just a good beer. Huh? I was thinking of starting something called stemware discussions. So I just bring, um, you know, get a one of our fine wine experts uh, to suggest some wines, and then invite only STEM teachers to have wine, and just. Hang out. Hang out. And Outer Islands also will yeah. be included in this <laughs> <laughs> you can Expand to like <laughs> But it is, I mean, it speaks to an issue that um, teachers are so, um, it's not just underappreciated. It's not just a lack of time. It's um, a lack of being empowered together and the conception of teaching as being a uh, non-team sport uh -huh. mm -hmm. throughout much mm -hmm. of the history of education in mm -hmm. our country and learning being not a team sport. I don't care if I'm an employer what an individual did by themselves because they're not going to ever work as an individual mm -hmm. in my business. Yes. It's always going to be very big diverse teams and how do you move together. So how come we don't focus on that more? In fact, why do we have grades anyway? Um, why do we have why do we have homework? Um, homework has not been shown to do anything to improve learning, just per se. And then the more deep challenge is, why do we say that the purpose of K twelve education is to succeed in college when colleges are becoming obsolete? in the typical form, and I'm speaking as a parent who doesn't want to spend four years worth of you know, money um, <laughs> to send my kids to get a four-year degree that's not going to mean that much anymore when they could all just hang out with you, box jelly, and get paid to do it hopefully in some way, or at least not pay tuition, and uh, could then get a job over at Ocean. I've got to say how sad I was to see that somebody was holding up a time signal. Like, just be aware that sometime this is going to come to an end. This has been a fantastic um, experience, and I just want to um, give a little bit of a roundabout in terms of, we were talking about Apple earlier. Somebody mentioned Apple, and um, when we were talking about creating those spaces where people come together almost unintentionally, um, I know that, that when he was uh, working on Pixar, that that was it. I teach this to my students that he designed it intentionally so that people could have unintentional conversations as they were moving around in the building. And to me, that's genius. Mm -hmm. um, how do we create that space for teachers? Because if we know that that's where those incredible, uh, energizing conversations happen that inspire us and create the next innovation, where, where can we do that as public school teachers, as independent school teachers? Um, and when I think also about, I, I've been trying to learn how to program an Arduino because one of my students came and said, I need to program this to do this thing. And I said, I have no idea how to do that. Go Google it. Um, <laughs> but in terms of helping teachers to be prepared for helping kids to ask those questions and dive deeper and not be the giver of knowledge, but the facilitator of go find out. I have no idea. Um, create your own project that is going to answer that question. How do we teach teachers to teach like that? That's a part of this puzzle that I don't think that we'll have time to dive into necessarily, but. But you know, like at Stanford, it's really interesting. <clears throat> the professors, at least on the design school side, they're the process experts. So they're just essentially teaching a way of thinking, a way of approaching how to solve problems. The students learn the latest, greatest technology somehow. They learn it. <laughs> But they're taught how to go about thinking about yeah. what to do versus how to do it. The point is like, okay, so you can figure out, you're gonna have to learn new skills, but what should we be working on? And that process of thinking is what they're the process experts on, and they empower the students. And the students basically just go, it's kind of like yeah. the movie. Yeah, Roman, It's exactly the movie. You know, it's, it's, uh, if you bear with me on this, this uh, short version, but I, I, 
been thinking a lot about the, I call it the three T's, which is most of education in the country is predicated on teachers trained in the subject matter, a text that lays out the information in an organized way for the student, and a test to determine how they did on it. The best learning experiences I see are where they've thrown all three of those out. And as you say, the teacher has the courage to say, I don't know, but you go for it. You know, and I'm here to try to help you figure it out. But you know, I've seen kindergartners in, in low income situations designing robots and making, you know, doing 3D printing. And, and, the, and then when those kids that are designing robots have to do their 10 minus 4 equals 6, it looks really easy for them. But, but again, it was the teacher said, I don't know how to design a robot, but you get to figure that out. And you start to think about that. And, it, it, you know, your point's exactly the right one, that, you know, the, the teacher that's willing to say, I'll support you, but I'm not the one who's going to tell you. You're going to be the one who figures it out. It's powerful. It so seems... one thing that somebody at this table is trying to figure out is how to design a new school. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes a Ju Julie, you're thinking of starting a new school, right? Yes, so I am. So in the midst of all of these challenges to revolutionize teaching and learning, what possibly possesses you to think you can succeed in how you do it? <laughs> Actually, I mean, the, for for me, my goal of the school is really to connect people back to the earth because of you know the climate change and all the sustainability that we need to do. And so, you know, I think for me, the idea is more about um, feeling rather than the thinking part. And so, I think that's why a lot of the conversations here have been quite different from what I had in mind. Because for me, I'm, you know, I'm wondering how can we connect, you know, like the Hawaiians used to live off the land. And so how is that connection there versus are we thinking about innovation today, right? So these are very different parts, I think, of the process mm -hmm. of teaching and education. So mm -hmm. yeah, so it's a, yeah, it's a very difficult question. And so I have a lot of, you know, it's great to listen to every single one of you because you guys have so many different ideas. And mm -hmm. so I got to write down a lot of different ideas on what I should co-op. You know, put in here, but again, you know, I want to get down to really the the connection, the relationship, the relationship to the earth. Mm. Yeah. You know, one one thing that I haven't heard so much about, but I, I think we touched a little bit about it, and, I, and which is kind of building on this whole idea of finding ways to uh, have people come together, especially teachers. But one thing I think would be very, very powerful, very interesting is is the students. Is how how do we incorporate the students where they're leading, they're helping to design mm -hmm. the school, and they're learning and their education. Like they like they're central to to this, and most times they're kind of on the periphery of this. They're kind of like we're testing with them versus kind of and designing for them versus designing with yeah. them, mm -hmm. and. And you know when we do these design thinking boot camps and everything, and we have the students there, they're the ones who are not—they're the five-year-olds, the ten-year-olds who who are just unbounded. They have like an unlimited creativity still on tap. They haven't had it beaten out of them. And then they, for the adults, we're like I'm totally amazed. Like the ideas, the creativity. If you ever watch like Master Chef Junior, and you watch these kids, <laughs> <laughs> oh, these kids. <laughs> Unbelievable! They're like blowing. They're, they're, they're beyond the adults, and that's what happens. And I think that's there's a huge thing that we're missing if we don't figure out how to put them at the center of all mm -hmm. of this and helping us rethink, redesign education and learning. Yeah. Sometimes we just have to get out of their way. Yeah, yeah they're, yeah, they're not. It'll be interesting to have a school where they're they're kind of designing the whole thing as we go along. So it might be, you know, again, you know, words, teacher, student, I mean, do we have to have those two words, right? Can we all be learners, mm -hmm. right? Because I think one of the things that really turns off students the most, and I certainly felt it when I was a student um, going through K through 12, was this authority relationship, mm -hmm. you know, that the teacher is telling you and they are the holders of knowledge mm -hmm. and you know, they have these rules that don't make sense to you, but you have to follow them. And if you break the rule, then you're punished and you're bad, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, that definitely turned me off and I think a lot of my classmates. And so how do you get to the point where you're like equalizing that relationship where we're all learning together? So, you know, I don't know. Let's go find out, you know. Um, 
And I think in that process, you know, you that that's where you develop this mutual respect for each other. And you're modeling respect to the children. You know, I respect your knowledge. And wow, what a great idea. I never would have thought of that. Um, and that's where, again, that relationship piece comes in. And that's where you're modeling um, great character for the kids. Yeah. And then they can go spread that as well. You know, and so, Julie, uh, Julie, as you design your school, you know, is that something that might be a valuable thing to think about? Is that there is no traditional teacher-student relationship. Mm -hmm. We're just all learning together, you know? Yeah. And I think that's another thing about education, what happens some, somehow that we're only learning in school. But I think, you yeah. know, yeah. remember that learning is like that's everywhere. one place we're not learning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, but the point's so powerful because, you know, students are so much more motivated by what other students think of their work. Mm -hmm. A student that recently learned something is probably better at explaining it to a different you know, new student who's struggling than somebody that's done it a million times. And so you get this leverage of having the student-to-student -student interaction. And then it's, it's also that mindset of, of, is school transferring information in a world where information is right at your fingertips? I think we'd all clearly say it isn't. Or is it creating and designing and building and making and learning? In which case, it's a much more symmetric level playing field. And I would think as a teacher, I'm not a teacher, but I would think it would be so much more enjoyable than trying to hold kids' attention in a world where you're competing against you know, the, the mall theater with 3D movies and angry birds and all this other stuff. So, Ian, you know, your, your reframing of that, and then uh, Sophie and Ted, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a story that I've often used when I've done professional development with, with teachers or, or with groups. Um, you really pushed me to think about it in a little different way. Uh, indulge me and I'll shorten the story. But um, basically, um, after my amazing experience at Hanaho'oli, um, as, an, as a student, I spent uh, six more years at a school that... Um, I, I dropped the name only when I'm trying to get a job, not when I'm trying to make friends. <laughs> uh, just for Ted's, for Ted's uh, 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 benefit, it's a school that Obama went to. Uh, so, um, it doesn't start with a P, does it? Not at all. It <laughs> might, maybe. But um, what, my, you know, my best memory from being at that school was, was a really good friend of mine, Springer. And um, to shorten the story, she, um, she was brilliant, right? And so her junior year, she ended up at... Um, in college without even having graduated perfect literally perfect on her SAT but also first string you know violinist uh, sports volleyball varsity like she was the all around amazing person and after she left university in her amazingness ended up teaching um, biology at Kuhuku High um, so Kuhuku being a really rural neighborhood here on, on Oahu um, one of the most rural places you could get on, on this island um, where kids, you know, for the most part, uh, you still have a population of kids who most of their life is spent either in Kuhuku or, or maybe, you know, the, the next area over Waimea Bay or maybe Laie, right? So that's like the world. And she has this girl in her class, um, someone, girl, Mormon, rural, female, um, really good at science. And this girl wants to... Um, you know, potentially wants to go on in, in science as a career, maybe medicine. And Springer's parents were both doctors, but both self-made doctors. So, you know, the, the mom put herself through school, became a doctor, married a construction worker, put him through school. He became a doctor. And so Springer's got this amazing opportunity because this girl, it's almost time for um, job shadow day. And so Springer tells this girl, you know, you could shadow my mom. Like, this could be amazing. So she gives a girl uh, a permission slip and tells the girl, you take it home. And again and again, the girl comes back day after day without the permission slip signed. So Springer, you know, has, she has to make a decision. Is she going to intervene and call the parents to get the permission slip back? Or does she really need to push this girl? Because, you know, this is the smallest bump in the road to becoming a doctor for this girl with all these indicators that she has, all these identifiers that make this journey hard for her, uh, harder for her than maybe somebody else. So she decides, you know, she's not going to... Girls, have, you got to do this. You, you, you have to do this. It's going to be such a long road for you to become a doctor. This is the first stage. Well, now it's the day that it's due, and the girl still hasn't turned it in. So that night, Springer calls the mom, and the girl begs her, please, please, please don't call my mom. Springer calls the mom anyway, and the mom picks up the phone. Springer says, you know, I, I need your daughter to turn in this permission slip. Explains the opportunity, how wonderful this girl might be in, in science. Explains the opportunity around Springer's parents. You know, this is going to be transformational in her life. And in uh, a way that only um, uh, someone, Mormon mom from rural Kahuku could do, she basically sat Springer down on the phone, metaphorically, and told Springer, uh, I hear what you're saying, 
it sounds wonderful. And I can hear where that might sound like success to you. But hear from me that that doesn't sound anything like success. For me, my daughter potentially going to medical school means that she's going to move away and go to the mainland for college. Um, in, in this rigorous program that she's going to be in, she's probably not going to be able to absorb the Sabbath. And her relationship with God is going to not be what, what she and I would expect it to be. And to me, that doesn't sound like success. In medical school on the mainland, she's probably not going to meet a nice someone Mormon doctor because they're, they're in short supply in most medical schools. She's probably <laughs> going to um, marry somebody who's from a different state and definitely not from Kahuku, most likely. That means she's not going to move back to our multi-generational family property. It means that her kids won't have access to her grandparents and our great-grandparents and the Samoan language and the Samoan culture and all these amazing things, including our church and our community. That is success for me as a mom. So, you know, Ian, when I, when I used to tell that story in, in PD, um, the, my original sadness was that, you know, she didn't go, right? And as an educator, we want all the doors open for kids. Then, you know, five years into this and, and me maturing a little bit, I, I kind of got a little bit of a um, window into maybe there's, you know, this cultural lens to this. There's a lot of credence there. And maybe we missed an opportunity to define success. And now, you know, after hearing you guys, I'm wondering um, why I've never thought of the student's voice in defining that success. And that it's not the teacher's definition of success versus the community definition of success. But, you know, there's, there's this other component of the student's definition of success that I never even really considered in telling the story. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I think that was really transformational for me. Yeah, I don't know if you're... If you, but most of you may know uh, uh, Keith Ayashi from my yeah. school. And Keith has told me so many stories that are related to the parents. You know, he had an event where he had all of his parents and the students there, their, their children there. And, and he asked the parents, so how many of your kids are going to go to college? No. College is not for everybody. I, 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 but he just threw that out. Nobody raised their hand. Nobody in this entire cafeteria, no parent raised their hand. And, and that was, uh, too, when he said to them, I said, wow, this is interesting. They're, the parent is such a powerful force because they said they, they sent a very clear message to their sons and daughters who said, well, maybe they, did, they, don't want to, they don't want to go to college. Maybe the student doesn't want to go to college. But for those that did, Nobody backed them up. Nobody, even their parents said, my kid is smart enough, or maybe he wants to go and I'm going to support him or her. The other one was Keith telling the story of this girl, kind of very simple, brilliant, got scholarships, got to, you know, to universal. She's going to go and she wants to go to college, but the family says, no, she cannot go because she's the one that has to stay home and watch the babies of her brothers and sisters. And it was just kind of this heartbreaking thing, right? It's like, where is the, you know, how, it's not just the student, the teacher, it's the, but it's the community and the parent part too. So the other key part that that is sometimes missing is, is the parent part. Like, like how the parent is and their expectations and how they support. Again, is it what the parent wants or is this what their son and daughter wants and how do you, how do you bring those things together? within this whole learning process, right? So that's the other part. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, there's there's a great um, educational documentary film. Uh, another Most great likely one. to An succeed. That another, one. <laughs> <laughs> another great one called uh, Schooling the World, uh, and it's about uh, the Ladakh region of northern India, where all the kids are encouraged to go off to um, go to college, become accountants and engineers and so on. And, they're really, and, the, and the filmmakers are interviewing the people who are left behind or say... There's nobody left here who knows how to grow food, who knows how to take care of the goats, who, you know, I think it goes back to Terry's initial question about, you know, place-based education. What is the best education for this place? Uh, because it's not the same in every every place, right? And it's not the same for every student, right? But, but you made me think, too, now, beyond that, so, like, you create all of these amazing young people, and they all left, right? So... So part of it is from a business standpoint, yeah. what kinds of industries are we creating in Hawaii that will give our young people the opportunity to, to have a thriving life here versus here's a one-way ticket. You're so educated, you're so talented, but so sorry, you have to leave or, or please start a company. You know, please create something here so you can stay here. So maybe the purpose of education in Hawaii is to 
help kids love themselves, love Hawaii, know who they are, um, joyfully explore all the possibilities um, for their future, and then just go design it. And then take care of their family and shape Hawaii's future and the world's future. We have to listen mm -hmm. to the kids, though. I mean, we need yeah. the adults to listen to what they're saying. No so question. I completely agree with you. But if we ask for their input and we are holistic in our process, then the voice of the kids, I think we all end up with this aha. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's such a difficult issue, this whole tension between, you know, whose life is it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Whose goals is it? You know, and, and I feel like one of the things we do is we, the kids are the rope in this tug of war, mm -hmm. right? And parents will tell kids from early ages what they need to be good at and do. And we will have a school that's largely around telling them how to think instead of teaching them to think. And so to me, the best thing we could do is from the very earliest ages, just Give kids that. I wrote this article in the Washington Post is what if the purpose of school was purpose? Equip kids to be thinking about their purpose in life, what problems they want to take on. What are they it's like you're talking about Stanford. Missions not majors. What are the challenges and the problems you want to make a difference in? And then leverage your passions, ability to learn, and your determination to make that difference. <clears throat> That's a school out. <laughs> That's a school out. Wow. So that went fast. Oh, good. Ted actually experienced Dr. Jackson's community ball at Seeks on Tuesday. Oh, okay. <laughs> the faculty got together to do their plus deltas after the day was over, and Ted had never seen. But the community ball is not just a, a fuzzy ball you pick up, it's actually built by the faculty by first starting with a, with, um, what do you call it? Balls yard. 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 And passing it around until you've actually got a ball which ties everybody together. And then the ball is used to throw across the room to whoever's talking. It's a bill of rights for speaking. Um, second thing is, um, thank you. Ted's going to um, spend five hours at Waipago High School tomorrow. Um, and, he's, and this is all compliments of Keith, who just returned my phone call immediately and said, let's bring him on campus. And we've got a whole immersion program largely built around their design thinking that they're doing. So he's going to get to see what those kids are doing. Um, third thing is, um, on Tuesday, Ted was out on Kaneohe Bay as uh, the guest of kind of Moku Voyaging Academy. We met them at their um, Kaalaia Hakipu um, staging area. And it was beautiful because they screened their film for Ted. And their film debuted at IF, and it was a wild it was, hit. It was incredible. And it's a beautiful one-hour documentary about these kids, these 12 kids who go out um, all the way around the Northwest Hawaiian Islands for, I think, seven days. Ten days, yeah. Ten days, yeah. Um, and so while this was all happening, I just had a spark, and through the joy of text messaging, I think that at the screening tonight, I'm going to start with their trailer. Oh, cool. And it's a one and a half minute trailer and it just causes everyone to go chicken skin. And the point being, this is us. This is our program. This is what we do. They put them on the canoe. They sailed them across Hakipu and they had a whole protocol on the other side with a charter school that comes on, on regular visits. And those kids taught Ted everything he needs to know about not making, about the names of the canoe and about ocean safety and why all of those were important. So the thing sixth is really, graders. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Sixth graders. So I'm thinking I'll start with that with that trailer tonight, and then that will lead into the film tonight. And what was the fourth thing? Fourth thing? No, can't remember the fourth thing. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thanks, thank you. thanks everybody. So I, the end game on this is uh, through the. Uh, the work of our technology director um, and putting together a front to back to this podcast um, and introducing it and then making it available um, as an iTunes uh, deliverable podcast and then it can be just a link that you can send to people and hoping that it will be a model for people who want to sit down and have a conversation, um, a civil and educated and, and um, innovative conversation, a design thinking conversation and that that can be passed around to whoever might want to use it and perhaps explore it in the same way that most likely has been passed around and has generated conversations that are similar to that. That was our goal today. So it's very cool. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hey Sophie. So just how awesome was that conversation? I have to say, Josh, that conversation was super deep. Cool. 
Hey, so we need to express our thanks to the wonderful participants in this conversation, including Ian Kitajima and Terry George, Julie Rogers, Kapono Siati, Ray Chung Fujihira, and Shauna Gunnarsson, Kelly Miyashiro, DJ Condon, and Sherry Nakamura. And of course, our huge thanks to Shannon Cleary, who helped coordinate this event. And Melissa Handy, thank you for recording and editing this podcast. And no problem. And a huge shout out to Pa'ahana Kincaid and Kupu Hawaii for letting us use their boardroom to record this podcast. Follow Grow the Collective Brain on Twitter and stay tuned for future podcasts.